This is Gina. She says, hello, smarty pants. Uh, I was re- <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I love it. She says, Gina Martin says, I was recently learning about circles and pi. I learned that the circumference of a circle can never be a whole rational number. I am having such a hard time wrapping my head around this, pun intended, wrapping my head around. Okay. Uh, could you please explain this a, a little better for me? Thanks, Gina from North Carolina. Mm. Wait, 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 wait. Is she correct? She, can't, can't you have the diameter be an irrational number and end up yeah. with the circumference rational? Yeah. So to be clear, if you want the circum, the circumference could be anything you want. It could be the number five. Um, I think what I think the intention of the phrasing was that the ratio of the circumference to the diameter could never be, or like if the diameter is a whole number, the circumference will never be rational. However, you want to phrase it, it's the relationship between those two that's fundamentally irrational. So it's like a like a game of whack a mole. You make one of them a nice number, the other one looks ugly. You make one of the other one nice, the first one becomes ugly. Oh, ugly! It becomes irrational. It becomes hard to write down. Um, this might not be satisfying, but instead of talking about um, circles, let's talk about squares. Where if you have a square and it's got a side length of one, and you ask how far is it to get from one side length to, from one di- uh, corner to the opposite corner, um, that ends up being the square root of two. This is something that follows from the Pythagorean theorem. This is another situation where this geometric length has an irrational relationship with the the first length we drew. So the ratio between that diagonal and the square side length is the square root of two. Now, that is irrational. It's also much, much easier to prove to you why it must be irrational. And if you will uh, indulge me, I think it's possible to do this in like 45 seconds and we we can see how this goes. All right, you ready? Here we go. Proof the square root of two is irrational. Assume that you could write it down as a rational number, right? Like maybe you think, oh, maybe square root of two is going to be, I don't know, like five divided by three, or maybe something more complicated, like 153 divided by 311. Like surely I can find big enough numbers that'll make this work. And I say, whatever you choose, we'll write it down as P over Q. We say that's the same thing as the square root of two. What that would mean, um, first of all, let's assume that it's fully reduced. So if, if you wrote something down like um, four divided by two, you could reduce that to be two divided by one. So there's no common factor. You can reduce this thing down. So if that was true, P divided by Q is the same as the square root of two. By definition, you're saying that P squared divided by Q squared is equal to two. So that's what it would mean by definition. So that means um, when you like multiply everything out by the bottom, that Q squared, P squared is going to equal two times Q squared. So if this, if you could write, come up with some numbers where it was true, you must admit that P squared is the same as two times Q squared. That means that P is an even number because it's two times something. P must be an even number. Um, yeah. And so you're like, okay, I don't know. Let's, let's call P, uh, you know, two times K or something, right? Um, it's some even number. If you then write this down algebraically and you replace it with two times K, you're going to conclude that Q also has to be an even number. Because when you take that key equation, P squared equals two times Q squared, that ends up looking like four times K squared equals two times Q squared. You divide some stuff out and you say, hey, Q also has to be an even number. So you must conclude that P is even. You must conclude that Q is even. But we assumed at the start that it was a reduced fraction. Both of those numbers couldn't be even, otherwise it wouldn't have been reduced. So there, there cannot be a way to write it as a fraction because otherwise you end up in this infinite regress where somehow both of them have to be even. But if you reduce it down, now both of those have to be even and you'll, you'll never get to a, a coherent answer. It's just a little weird that to get this irrational number, you have to take the ratio of two numbers. That's just a, that, it's a weird fact. So great. Uh, so this is the common mathematician tool. They say, oh, you want to prove that something's impossible, right? They suspect, they're like, man, this problem's really hard. I think it might be impossible. Like they have, they have a big ego. And so they want to say, hey, it's not that I can't solve it because I'm dumb. It's because no one can solve it. So they want to <laughs> prove that it's impossible. Classic tactic. What you do is you say, I'm going to start by assuming it's possible, like writing some notation to say, what if it was possible? What would follow from that? And then you come to some kind of contradiction. Um, You say, so see, if we assumed it was possible, we land on this thing that could never be. Therefore, our assumption was false. So that's a a very common mathematician thing. I love that, what you just did. I love starting with the square. That's very cool. Yeah. All right. Okay, here we go. I'm Tian from Vietnam. Uh, If your two journey 
to Flatland, what shape would you use, I mean, would you choose to be, and what activity would you like to do there? Thank you, longtime fan of Star Talk, and both of you. Tell us about Flatland. I happen to have a copy right here on my desk. Oh, oh really? That's great. Right there. Yeah, I've got one over on the shelf over here. So this is, yep. this is a very classic book where um, the author... How do you imagine a world that's just two-dimensional? So here in three dimensions, you can look left, right, up, down, in, and out. But he said, what if you were just on this two-dimensional world and that's all the world was? And so you have a bunch of creatures there. And he was making this analogy to say, like, wouldn't it be really hard to describe three-dimensional shapes to them? Like if you have someone who lives in Flatland and you want to describe what a cube is or a sphere or like a donut, there are these shapes, you just really can't describe it to them. And then the purpose of the book was then to say, hey, if there's geometric shapes in four dimensions, we are. it is as hard to describe to us as it is for us to describe to Flatlanders. But to the to the question on what shape would I be in Flatland, um, eh, yeah, circ- I mean, it's kind of basic maybe, but circle seems useful. You can roll around. Um, everything's nice and symmetric. Uh, you can do circle inversion, which, uh, you know, our, the other patron boy is certainly going to appreciate. Um, but uh, that's probably all I got. As I remember the story, the more sides you had, the more aristocratic you were. Ooh, look at you. Right, yeah. so a triangle would be like the lowest, the scum of the earth. Mm. <laughs> Those triangles, I can't believe that. <laughs> Trying to move in here, they know better. <laughs> and then the squares, and then pentagons, hexagons. Right, right. So I think I'd be a hexagon. Mm. Okay. I'd be a hexagon. You want to tessellate the plane? Yes, I ah, want to. Ah, look at that. Yeah. Although, any shape can tessellate, right? Uh, well, not any shape. I mean, you got yeah, your squares, I, you got your triangles. No, no, no. I mean, if you look at if you look at Escher paintings, he is, isn't that tessellation where you have two, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. two shapes intersect? Right. So the, the difference is I, I'm a what they call a regular polygon where all my sides are equal to each other. Right. Then it's only the hexagon. But I think tessellation is all shapes that can do that is called tessellation. Isn't that right? Well, not any shape can tessellate. So you're right no, that agree. Escher shows you've got this infinite family that can tessellate. I agree, but yeah. he has like uh, angels and devils tessellating. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that you can test, that's called tessellation, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, 100%. Right, right. So so now if, you, if you're going to restrict yourself to a to a shape, to a, a, a polygon, right. what's called a regular polygon, then we're limited, right? But yeah, So I want to yeah. be a hexagon because you can tile a floor with a hexagon. Yes, you can, yeah. And get other people to tile with you and you can snuggle and, you can, right. and everything fits. Fits all, very, very snugly together. Snugly. Very cool. So mm-hmm. what shape would you be? Now that we're talking about tiling, there was a whole tile that was discovered a couple of years ago that's a single tile that tessellates in a non-periodic way and it can't tessellate in a periodic, but it only tessellates non-periodically. I heard about so, that. But yeah. but is that is a regular it, polygon or is it just some other no, shape? No, 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 no. It's a wild sh- It's not that weird a shape. Uh, it, it, look, it looks like a hat, kind of, people call it. Um, but what's cool is it was discovered by an amateur. Um, so it was this, people didn't know if such a, if there was a shape that um, tiles things non-periodically uh, or that tiles things non-periodically without having any periodic tiling is the like technical question. <laughs> but it's just like an interesting tiling question. An amateur found it and it became a little fun celebrity of the math internet for a couple months back then. So what's the difference between a periodic and a non-periodic pattern? Great. So most of the patterns you can think of are periodic. Like It's kind of what we mean by pattern. Almost, yeah. Like if you shift the whole picture and it looks identical. So you take your hexagon tiling and then you like shift your view over by one hexagon, it looks identical. So that's what we would mean by periodic. Um, it wasn't even known that you could have a non-periodic tiling uh, for a while, but Penrose, who very famous for physics reasons, uh, he found a way to use these two tiles that each look like a rhombus to have a pattern that fills all of space, but it never repeats. So it's a it's a it's a describable pattern. Um, you can describe what it should be, but it never repeats. So when you shift your viewing point, it will never look identical. So there's no way to shift it to be the same as what it once was. Yeah, it's kind of like how the digits of pi or these irrational numbers they they don't repeat themselves. They just go on and on in a predictable way, but not that repeats itself. It's the geometric equivalent of that. Okay, very cool. Ooh. 